Okay. I want to welcome all of you here. Thank you for eating. There's a lot of food, as you noticed. Um, so feel free to um, fill your plate more than once if you'd like to. We'll be taking the remainder over to the gala. There's the One X Gala tonight, so it will be taken. Um, the, the kids will appreciate it. But at the same time, there's some for you here to enjoy. Please do. So my name is Lisa Kearns. I want to welcome you all um, tonight. I am the Parents Association President for the years 2019-2020. It's an honor and a privilege to serve in this role. Um, thank you for coming tonight. This is actually a general meeting. We have three of these every year, and tonight's a special one because of our headliner. Um, there are two more coming up. The next one is on February 22nd, which is called Day in the Classroom, which is a Saturday event. Randy Barnett, our assistant head of school, is working with four different teachers here at Lick to offer classes for you to take. Um, one of them will be in the shops. Last year we had a history class. Um, they vary every single year, so you can do this every all the four years you're here at Lick to get a sense for what your students experience on a daily basis. So there'll be more information coming out in the E-Tiger as we finalize the schedule for that day, but it's, a, it's an early morning 8.30 to 11.30 event here on campus. Um, and then our next the last of the PA general meetings will be with Randy Barnett again, and it is um, course scheduling. That is going to happen on April 8th at 6 o'clock here in the evening, and that's to help you help your students navigate their experience um, with their courses as we move as they move forward up in the, the grades here at school. So um, look for more information in the e Tiger. So um, I'm going to show you something. For those people interested in finding out all of the wonderful things the PA uh, gets to sponsor, I wanted to show you what, how you can access that. So you're going to go to the web page here and log in with your personal account. And then this resource board is what automatically populates. If you scroll down to Parents Association, we have built out a calendar of events right here and this is a two-pager I know this is new this year very exciting um, which lets you know month by month all of the fun things we have here on campus did you know we have a knitting club we do we have book club um, and this but my theme for the year which is why this event tonight is on a Friday night is it is come for some information and stay for an event so the, as you know or don't know the one X will be following this event tonight most of these receptions have been lined up um, so that there will be an event following them. So for instance, let's look down here. The Senior Parent 13th Year Reception on May 8th will be followed by the Choral and Orchestra Gala right afterwards. So the intent is we're bringing you to campus. We're going to give you a reason to stick around and stay on campus and enjoy some of the um, performances the students have put together and worked so hard on. So anyway, feel free to log into this. It's right there. You can print it out. For those of you who like paper, um, otherwise you can just take a picture and have it on your phone. But I just wanted to make a point to show you that. Oh, if someone's taking a picture right now, thank you. So um, that's available for you um, to just so you can be in the loop as to what's happening. And we are fortunate, as you know, tonight to have our head of school, Eric Temple, here, who's going to be speaking to us about the strategic plan, as well as some high-level results from the perceptions survey that was completed in the fall and winter. I think that went to 10th and 12th grade families. Um, and before he speaks, we're also very fortunate to have our chair of the Board of Trustees, Lara Witter, with us, who's going to say a few words. And um, most importantly, I just want to thank you again for being here. And please, fill your plates on your way out the door. Thanks again. Have a great evening. Uh, my name is Laura Witter. I'm the chair of the uh, LIC board. And I just wanted to um, say, first off, that we're very excited about um, the work that we've done this year. Um, we worked on the strategic plan over the summer and into the fall, and uh, we're re really excited to pass it. And now it's the work of um, prioritizing and work planning and, and getting working on that. Uh, but I wanted to thank all of you that participated in the process of gathering information, and I also wanted to point out and thank Trisha Stone, who's an ex-board member. Trisha's right here. You can just raise your hand. Uh, and, um, and, uh, 
uh, she really led us fearlessly and uh, coordinated a lot of different uh, moving parts um, and really got us uh, working on that. So, so thank you, Trisha, very much. Um, and uh, let's see what else I was going to say. Um, you know, and I think Lake is in a really great place right now to leverage the work of the strategic plan and um, to work on you know the challenges that are ahead so we have you know whether it's um, inclusion whether it's affordability there's a lot of big um, big big issues at, at stake so that we need to continue working but I think we have a lot to leverage from and uh, look forward to the work ahead so thank you all thanks Laura thanks Lisa hi everyone how's it going I don't need sound I'm, I'm the sound today. Okay, so before we get going, um, if you could please turn to somebody you don't know. I know you're sitting with people you do know, so you have to find somebody you don't know, say hello, and tell them a, uh, tell them who your favorite high school teacher was and why. Okay, ready? Go. <laughs> one another to introduce ourselves to someone we don't know and to find something about them that we may not know and um, we'll talk more about why we are really going to start practicing this in a very purposeful way with our parent community with our adult community and with our students going forward so also there's seats right up front haha -ha, you have to sit here <laughs> um, but there's also extra chairs if you want to take one so um, so tonight's agenda, I'm gonna go through the, some key performance indicators. I do this each year. Um, these are sort of the high level stats of the school. They're meant to make all of you feel like the school, and actually, honestly feel, um, <laughs> not pretend feel, um, that, um, that the school is in a very solid position when it comes to key performance indicators. Then I'm going to um, review some of the very high level perception survey results. And they're very high level in part because our institutional researcher, our amazing Juan Berman, has been on maternity leave. So we um, have gotten, so basically this is what I could come up with. <laughs> um, but no, there's so much data in there and there's a lot of analysis that needs to be done. So I just pulled a few things to share with you. And then really the purpose, um, the, the big exciting piece is to roll out our new strategic plan, which we're so excited about. 
So um, what I'm going to do is after each of these sections, we'll just pause and I can take some questions. But also, there'll be plenty of time at the end for questions as well. Does that sound good? Yep. Great. OK, so admissions. Just to let you know, if you have a kid in the admission pool, I'm really sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, so there's my little pointer. So um, here's our applications for this year. Um, so I show you this slide just to give you a few things. We have about the same number of inquiries that we've had, the same number of shadow visits. <laughs> Our applications are up about 21% this year. And then, of course, we haven't decided on the offers and we haven't a yield. I show you this as both um, something to be proud of and that it's a desirable school, but also as a tremendous challenge for the school that believes in access. You never want to be known as a school that students can't get into. The other thing is you think about how many students need to come through for interviews, for shadow visits, for open houses, and the resources it takes to serve the interest at the school. So yes, it's great. And, and by the way, these slides will be posted on the website so you don't have to, um, you don't have to take notes. <laughs> I love that, unless you like to. Um, so it's, it's great, it's really exciting, um, and yet it's also a challenge. So what you'll see is many of our strengths are also some of our challenges. Um, we will accept, we are shooting for a class of 139 students again. So there you have it. Um, here's some stats about enrollment, and as you know, we've been growing the school over the years. So. Next year, we predict that we will have 538. Actually, what we will have is 541. What we do is we, um, we budget to allow five students a year, if they so choose, to take a semester away from school. So um, this year, we only have one. Thank you, Lila's daughter. <laughs> um, but some years we, we allow, we have space in our budget for five students. I very strongly believe in alternative educational experiences for, for students, especially in that junior year. Sometimes it's just, they need to do something else and that's healthy. So we predict we'll have 541 bodies, but budget-wise, we'll, we're budgeting for 538. Does that make sense? Um, and what I really am proud of for the school is Five years ago, we had 175 students on flex, and we're predicting that we'll have 198 next year. So again, one of the purpose, one of the reasons to grow the school population was not necessarily to increase the percentage of students on flex, but by growing the size of the school population, we knew we could grow the number of students receiving flex. Um, and we are um, able to do that. Um, not in this slide is, over 25% of our operating budget goes to support the flexible tuition program. So it'll be almost $7 million next year, I think that's right. Um, and it's about twice what any other Bay Area high school is, is doing. So it's very much part of our mission and um, very committed to doing as much as we can. How do we do that? Well, Nancy is very busy. <laughs> Um, and her staff. So again, over the years, our um, annual fund has grown significantly. Um, this is to date, so we still have some work to do. If you haven't given, we just, you know, just participate. We really love that. Um, and, you know, this alumni thing is really interesting to us. Um, and this is not atypical for independent day schools. Um, independent day high schools and schools in general have a really hard time engaging their alumni in the annual fund. And we work at it really hard. But we can always use more ideas and more help, so we'll keep putting our resources into that. Um, some employee demographics. <laughs> so we've grown from 117 employees to 135. Five years ago, we were about 38% Employees of color today were 60%. Um, and then faculty, we've grown from 56 five years ago to 61, 40, 
and then 48%, 47.5% are faculty of color. Um, so we've really worked hard at diversifying our workforce here at Lipcomb mm -hmm. and and compared to many other independent schools, we're doing some really great work. We've done that through um, engaging in a lot of training and anti-bias hiring um, and very um, clear-cut hiring protocols that eliminate sort of the biases that we carry with us when we read resumes, when we hire people we, that look like us or that have the same experience as us. And so we've just created a really amazing group of faculty here. We're gonna continue to work on that. Um, of interest also is how experienced our faculty is. So if you look um, here, 28 out of our 61 faculty are 45% basically have 20 years or more of teaching experience. So that's really good for schools. It's really challenging for the future. <laughs> so again, it's the, you want experienced faculty. Teaching is one of those, um, those professions where you learn a lot about students, about how to manage a classroom, how to do all sorts of things through your experience. I can tell you some of the scariest stories of my first year teaching. Um, I didn't ruin any child, but I tried. Um, <laughs> um, but it's amazing how much you learn as a teacher the more, the more years you're in the classroom. So we have a wonderful, amazing faculty here with really great experience. However, we will start seeing retirements. Um, and so the school is starting to position itself for a younger group of faculty, and they, they, um, you know, younger faculty have different needs, and so we're looking, and you'll see in the street, all this will lead to the strategic plan and what we're doing there. But it may be something along like, do we have a debt, a school debt forgiveness program? Right, currently we don't. Do we allow um, teachers to teach in different departments? Right, we do a little bit of that. With younger folks have been trained in cross-disciplinary thinking, right? So there's a lot of things. Um, many people go into the teaching professor with the other Cam, also. I was thinking of amazing young teachers, just amazing people. Um, with the same level of responsibility that they leave the profession with after 40 years, right? If you're a classroom teacher. Well, how do you know you're growing in your profession? How do you know that you're actually becoming um, better um, that you have more responsibility. So we've started to create small little ways for people to advance as a teacher, whether that's as a team lead. We now have rotating department chairs. So it used to be you were a department chair for life, no longer at the Florida High School. So there's a lot of different protocols and processes, and you'll see that reflected in the um, strategic plan as well, to start really setting us up for this wave of um, folks who are gonna Maybe eventually leave. Maybe not. Maybe they'll, they'll invent something that makes you live forever. No. <laughs> um, so tuition, um, look, continues to be pretty much in the middle of the pack. Um, so here, can, sorry. So here's our tuition. But when you add, most schools don't. Um, they, they break out tuition and then they charge a fee for lunch and books and other things and we don't, it's all included. So when you do that, this is where we fall compared to our benchmark schools. Um, so, you know, that's a real bargain. <laughs> I'm sure everybody realizes that. Um, you can see we're all fairly close together. Um, and. Um, the IRS is not at all interested in that. Um, but, um, you know, there's a certain cost to doing business, right? And, 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 and we're pretty much in, in line there. Um, one thing that it does really try to do, though, is try to manage tuition increases. So you can see, oops, um, over the years, we basically have averaged 4.37. So we have never had big swings in tuition. Um, and so if you're a freshman family, you can make 
the assumption that your tuition most likely will go up each year somewhere between four and five percent. Our goal is to, however, keep tuition tied to CPI and have it be between one and two basis uh, points of percent above CPI, and that's mainly to cover health insurance costs that go up usually about eight to 12%. So, that make sense? That's how, we, that's how we're doing. You can see the last year's average for schools was 4.87, we were 4.25. If you're at Head Rice, got that one. Oh, university, oh dear, no. <laughs> just kidding. Um, um, so that's just, we, we really are working hard to tie our tuition directly to CPI so that it's in line with what people are, hopefully, what their incomes are also going up. Questions? So those, those are some high level data about the school. Any questions about those? Yeah? So maybe it's because I have an eighth grader. On the offer acceptance thing, you had these things in parentheses next to the uh, off offers. Yeah. And it was quite a huge number inside the parentheses. I just wondering what that was. Yeah, those are the special yeah. children. No. Um, <laughs> so what we did in 1516, because our yield, so this is a very, so the yield is basically the number of offers to who accepts, right? Most, most, most day schools have about a 67% yield. Our yield is very high, so we had to start with initial offers that were lower. So right now we're a one to one, so we offer about, so this year we offered 140 spots for 138, but then we took 26 kids from the wait list okay, that's to fill those spots. Okay. Does that make sense? So we want to be really transparent that these are our initial offers, and then these are the kids that came off of the wait list okay. to fill the class. Yeah. Eric, you said applications are up 21% this year. What's driving that? That seems like a very large increase. The amazing freshman class, Rich. Let's just know. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it's really hard to know what's, what's driving it. Um, Anecdotally, we, well, we have some, um, Ravenna is our software, we have some data from Ravenna, and I believe the Bay Area increase is about 4%, and then we have some anecdotal information from some schools that have, are flat. I don't quite know why we're up 21%. Um, I mean, we have an incredibly hardworking admission team that goes out to lots and lots of schools, I mean, traditionally, Lick has gotten more application than other schools for various reasons. I think one is, I think we do offer more tuition, flexible tuition. So I think there are some families that may only apply to, let's say, Lowell and Lick, right? And say, look, if we can't get go to Lick, we're gonna go to a public school. Um, and then we know we get a lot of small parochial school applications for a similar reason. I do think our diversity um, is a draw in that when people come here, they don't feel as though they would be representative of a certain group, that there is a certain critical mass of different types of people, so they feel a little bit more comfortable walking in the door. That doesn't mean we don't have a tremendous challenge with our um, community around how we work together, but I think just seeing yourself represented when you visit, I think can create a comfort level when you when you see who's in the in the building. Um, you know, I think maker programs have really taken off across K through eight. And though other schools have maker programs in high school, I mean come on. <laughs> we, we've been doing it for hundred and twenty five. No, I really do think our tech art program is amazing. It's not the only reason a, a student would choose like, but I think it is attractive, especially for kids who really got turned on to that and they don't want to stop that. Um, and then, you know, I think being a school with a public purpose, even though again, 
we have a lot of growth to do. I do think purpose appeals to kids now, maybe more than it did. Um, and I'll actually show some stats that kids are appreciating learning about how to make a difference. Good question, no. but I didn't really answer it because I don't know. <laughs> Other questions about some of the data? Yeah. Continuing on that theme, to that end, do you, do you know or do you have a feeling for why you, the yield was as low last year and so many kids you can away from compared to people? Yeah, no, don't. I forgot. I mean, Crystal crunched it for us. Um, it, it wasn't really, 75 is still a pretty high yield. Um, I don't, sorry. I could make, do you want me to make something? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. I, I did know, but other questions? Yeah. So yeah. it looks like this year we're only at 66% or something. Um, and is that usual for this time of year, or are we behind where we usually are? So it's a, Nancy, do you want to chime in, or? If you want to. Yeah, go for it. I'll take a chance to get the microphone. Okay. Uh, it is fairly typical. Um, hi, I'm Nancy Keeble, I'm the development director. It's good to see some people come out. Um, fairly typical for this time of year. Um, we are actually fairly flat with our percentages and our dollars um, compared to this time last year. And I'm happy to say that right before this meeting, I found out that we're at 1.5 million. So all these numbers are changing all the time. So we're up a couple percentage points probably. So we feel okay about where we are. We always make a big effort in the fall, but we also want to meet people where they are. So we're not like some schools that try to do 100% in 100 days or these, you know, fast, fast annual funds. We want people to give when it works for them. We just want to get to at least 90 questions per year. <clears throat> so, is that satisfactory? Okay. Yeah. So, so yes, it's about where we normally are. Yeah. No? That's it. Okay. Um, the other thing about faculty, you know, there's so many data, there's so, like I could just keep throwing, right? So there's nothing here about, the, right now we know of two teachers who are, won't be returning to the school next year. Um, I don't think they've um, announced it students yet, so we won't announce it. Um, but so the school has very low attrition when it comes to faculty. Um, so that's also a good sign, by the way. Um, so, but we know of two people. Here, I have a question. Yeah. Um, it's not in your data here, but um, I've heard you speak about, um, you know, how many uh, middle schools you draw from. I'm curious what the trend is on that over the years. Yeah, so um, I believe there's 138 middle schools represented in the entire school. Um, I think we drew from 72 middle schools last year. Um, there, it is a source of pride in the admission office to get students from a new school every year. <laughs> it's like a competition. Um, and um, it, it's important, and I'll tell you why. Um, the most we like really from any one school is five kids. We will take seven or eight sometimes. I mean, especially when you have siblings and all of that kind of thing. Um, but we want our students to enter the ninth grade not feeling as though they're already part of a group of kids and therefore are empowered in the community to be together and to not stretch and not try to meet other people and to not have to bump up against being new, right? And so we purposely really try to bring kids from so many different schools. There are tremendous challenges with that. So other schools will have clearly 20% of their kids come from certain schools. That brings a certain culture with you. You can, sometimes that's great. Sometimes that culture is not something you want in your school. Um, there wasn't, I don't know if you know this, but at one time the head of town school was also the head of the morning high school. This was um, Ed Rich in, um, Gosh, it was the 50s, I think it was. Um, and town, there was no other high school, really, um, private high school. There was SI um, in Lowell. Um, and, there, and then I think Berks 
and Hamlet had high schools, um, and um, and Lick was the boys' school. So the kids from town came to Lick. It wasn't always such a great thing, by the way. I love town school. I'm on the board there. But in other words, like you bring cultures with you and you bring large groups of people, right? So we really want to create sort of everybody's new feeling. And so it's important for us to pull from lots of schools all over the place. It's also then really challenging to create a cohesive group sometimes. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Clear. And also, if there's data you'd like to see that, I mean, because I'm just, you know, again, we could, I don't know if you know this, but I like data, um, then just email me, and I'm happy to share. Um, so the Perception and Satisfaction Survey was sent to all 10th and 12th grade students and their parents and guardians. This is part of a longitudinal study that we began in 2013. And it really um, began as a marketing study to better understand prospective families and has since turned into a um, sort of a heat map on how, what our major strengths and challenges are. Um, we're a little, we're less concerned about the actual numbers that we get, but the positioning of, of what people mean as, as the top um, needs of the school or areas for growth and the top strengths. So I'm just gonna, these are just some things I pulled out. There's, there's a lot that I'm not sharing. Not because I don't want to, but I'm not ready to. We're not, I just didn't have a chance. So here's a question which was for the parents. Um, how well was your student supported when they came to Lick? So it's hard to read, but 20% feel like they needed more support. Most people felt like their kid was supported. But this is a really interesting number because it actually correlates exactly with what the students are saying. About 20% of the students felt like they could have used more support. So now, and this is the great thing about data, right? Now you start cutting it according to demographic. So is there a group of students that are saying this more than other students? So are there students, let's say, from the peninsula who feel less supported than students from San Francisco. And then you do focus groups to really understand the experience as they entered the school. Is that, so, this, so data at this level just gives you sort of broad pictures. Now we have to go and do the, the bigger work. So we're at the big picture stage right now. Um, I love this question. Um, this was, when you think about your student's experience, um, how has the school prepared them to address social inequities outside of school? So 267 uh, parents responded, and this is a pretty good number here. You know, people think, yeah, it's really doing it. The kids thought the same thing. I'll show you the student thought uh, as well. Here's um, the question is caring about the world around them. Again, um, you know, a lot of people are think that the school is helping the school prepare them. And this to me, this is about mission, a delivery on mission, right? So again, we have more analysis to do, but there is a feeling out there that the school is preparing their kids to care about the world around them. Um, we asked caregivers, what are our greatest strengths? It's a hard thing to read, so I'll read it. Academic success, student life, this cracks me up because it's the exact opposite for kids. Um, <laughs> um, providing students with more opportunities to get involved outside of school is a success, like we do that. Um, and then educating the whole style and advoca advocacy and serving different communities. These are our major strengths according to the parent, the 10th and 12th grade parent community. Does that make sense? And again, we haven't cut this demographically. We haven't looked at how many rated which one which. This is just the, the top five. For the areas of growth, we have to grow in their academic success. Wait a minute, I'm really confused. <laughs> so another really very common thing, right, for schools is your greatest strengths often are some of your greatest challenges. So um, what I believe the area for growth on, 
an academic success is, which I'll show you in some of the open-ended, is around um, paying attention to the mental health of students, right? So I think people appreciate the rigor and how good the school is academically and are very concerned about how hard the school is for our students. Um, I, I think we'll know more soon. Um, we need to work on making the school accessible for students who are different from each other, um, developing a caring and inclusive school community, and educating the whole student and advocacy and different communities. So. Here are some open-ended remarks. Fairly random. I tried to pick ones that were representative of multiple um, comments. But these are just some. And oh, and by the way, there will be a much fuller report of this in the spring. When we, so this won't be the only time we report out on the results. So um, as you can see, there's a lot of discussion on parents around the stress that kids are facing. Um, at the same time, this happened with both kids and parents. There's a lot of worry about the stress, and there's a lot of concern that we're going to um, curtail the number of academic solids that kids can take. Interesting. Um, um, the diversity of the school has a strength, but also that it is challenging that there's an emphasis on building of silos rather than building bridges. Um, and then there's a lot of lovely, lovely comments that it's just a very special place for their kids, right? And you can simultaneously hold a lot of these at the same time, right? So, so. so those are parents. The students, as I mentioned, about 20% felt like they needed more support. When we asked them, caring about the world around me, the students really felt like the school has prepared them to do that. It made me really happy for a moment. <laughs> as long as that has a can be happy. No. <laughs> and then addressing social inequities out of school. Also, I think, fairly, fairly positive. Always more work to do. Our greatest strengths are academic success. Um, maintaining a low teacher-student ratio. It's a lovely thing for students to recognize that they really appreciate having access to their teachers, right? They appreciate smaller class sizes where they can have a voice in that classroom. That's important. Being reputable. Um, developing a caring and inclusive school community, they saw it as a strength. You'll also see that as a challenge. And providing students with more opportunities to get involved outside of school. So they appreciated that, um, that there was that opportunity here. So our areas of growth, these meant that they were all tied, right? So in other words, there wasn't one that rose to the very top. There was an even distribution over these first four of the number one. Does that, does that make sense? So student life, they thought, needed some work. Developing a caring and inclusive school community, the education of the whole student, maintaining a low teacher-student ratio, and providing students with more opportunities to get outside, involved outside of school, right? So again, there's quote unquote conflicting conversation, you know, conversations. That's why you have to start talking to people to understand it. Um, so I'll just pause at this point with some of the perception things and ask questions or ask are there questions? Oh wait, open-ended remarks. Um, <coughs> You know, the kids are really concerned about the stress level. They're, they're really, really concerned about it. Um, and um, they feel like the amount of work is just really impacting them in very negative ways. Yeah. So, and you'll see in our strategic plan, we, we take that very seriously. I will say something that is interesting. When I was asked to join the school nine years ago, it was right when we got rid of AP exams. And at that point, the school was very concerned about its academic reputation. Um, it was concerned that it wouldn't be, or that it wasn't being seen as a serious academic school. Um, and that students were choosing other schools because we were not, quote unquote, a high-powered academic school. So it's interesting how things 
can change, right? Um, I was never worried about that, knowing how how good the, the, the curriculum and the teaching is here. Um, but I think the times have changed as well, right? And so now we're not, I don't think that's a concern. Is that a concern of any, well, I know there's a concern around some areas of study, um, but I'm hoping that nobody feels like this is a school that doesn't prepare kids well academically, right? I think that, that we do that. Actually, I'm not gonna put you on the spot because you may think it doesn't and then you can come talk to me. Yes, Susan. <laughs> No, I was just going to point out that um, I think we need to make the kids aware again of the AC plans because if you end up at a state school, you can just go and take them dry without studying and those threes that the lit kids can achieve pretty easily yeah. because we do teach well here, it actually propels them really far forward yeah. and our kids aren't encouraged to take them anymore um, and they come in handy actually. Yeah, so you can take the exam here at the school, and we do talk to the students and the college counselors talk to the juniors and um, about taking them, and um, at least they're supposed to. It's also in our guidebook, um, and so, and actually the number of testers have remained about the same over the last four years. We usually have about 70 students who choose to sit for an exam hasn't changed that much and it does help if you go to a state um, school and or and a UC it can help as well um, yeah Elizabeth So um, for sure. Um, now I will tell you the former survey for those of you who have been here a while, but <laughs> it was a gauntlet. It was about a 35 to 40 minute survey. We so we changed it. We made it now. I think it takes about 15 minutes, maybe 10, 15 minutes. So um, so we can't do apples to apples anymore. But there we did purposely design it so that we can do some cross referencing. It won't be the exact so from a statistical standpoint, it won't stand up to you know um, the the rigors that you expect, Elizabeth. But um, <laughs> but. Um, um, but we, but, but it will give us good information, right? And I, so an example of one of our areas for growth in 2013 was the school's campus, right? It was noted that it was not necessarily the most up to date, right? So, and actually that number kept going down as we announced plans for the building. So once you call your attention to something, Right, people pay attention. So, so that's just an example, right? I will say, as a smaller school, I think we got higher marks around being an inclusive community. I think that's more of a challenge, or more that people are are talking about now than perhaps they were, right? So that's something to really pay attention to. Yeah. I had a question when the students said that their number one place for improvement was student life. And I kind of want to leave the mental health part aside and say, what what were their issues? Was it school spirit or camaraderie or cohesiveness or what, yeah. what, were, they, what were their concerns? So I can only um, lean that from the open-ended part, which was really about mental health, sleep, um, being able to do other things besides school. Um, oh, so so, so that, I like the feeling of community. I, you know, that's where we have to go and do focus work group. I think they're saying student life is my life, <laughs> right? And my life is all school all the time, right? And I'm kind of over it. So, yeah, yeah. So, good, really good question. Other questions about the perception at this point? I know it's really high level. There's not a lot here, but other thoughts? Yeah. Mine is just a comment. Um, 
Yes, I'm happy that you said sleep because I know that's one of the issues that a lot of kids have is uh, they're very, very, very little sleep because the academic rigor is so intense. But um, returning students have said that college is much easier to lick, so that's a nice thing um, for some of them on the flip side. So we'll see. Yes, yeah, so just to repeat that, and, um, um, that uh, students are concerned about the rigor, they're concerned about sleep, they do recognize the benefits of their preparation when they go to college because they feel really prepared. And so while maybe some of their friends might be struggling, that they actually are finally leading a healthy life. <laughs> um, um, and, and so, yes, we take prepar right? We are a college preparatory school. That's, there's no question there. We take that responsibility very, very seriously. I do think um, it's really important to always ask ourselves, because a student can do something, should they be doing it, right? And I think when you work with a highly motivated, highly talented group of kids, and you have a faculty that cares so much about what they're doing, it's easy to lean in and push kids because they, it's exciting. And then sometimes I think we have to remind ourselves, wait a minute, it's, this isn't college. They don't have to do this right now, right? But, but yes, we, we do, especially around writing. So I'm an English teacher from way back when. There is no way to learn to write without writing. There is not. You cannot magically take a, like an elixir and become a good writer. You have to write. Writing is hard for teenagers, especially for boys. Because you have to be able to access your emotional intelligence in order to write. And I'm not saying boys don't have emotional <laughs> it, just, it just gets developed a little bit more slowly than girls. So it takes time, and it takes practice, and it's hard, it's painful. And so you've got to get them writing, and they have to write and write and write. And the more they do it, the better they get at it. And when they go off to college, they can write an essay. And boy, that's a leg up in the world right there. So, so yes, they're working hard, and we don't want to make them not work hard, but we don't want them to feel like there's no hope in their life, right? We want them to somehow feel like this is manageable. So, other thoughts? Yeah? Just a quick question regarding the mental health issues. I'm wondering if there is any data or any plan to collect data about the relation, the correlation between the family pressure and expectation with the students, um, what they're going through outside, outside the school, um, how is that affecting or not affecting? Yes, we don't have um, strict causality um, yet. There are plenty of studies of adolescents and what causes their um, it, the increased levels of depression, of suicidal ideations, and of stress. Um, they're the first long-term major study, and I have not read it yet, so I'm just going to quote what I've heard of it, which is really bad practice, and we would, we would smack a child's hand with a dump, dump it. But is, um, on social media has just been released. I don't know if anybody's had a chance to read it yet. Intense use of social media does lead to depression, according to this study. Like, finally, <laughs> they can say this, right? Um, so that's something. I think that contributes. Um, I also think there is something, I mean, I, I'm hypothesizing now, but through observation, right, I've been doing this for a long time. I think um, there's a great book called Driven to Distraction, I don't know if any, but um, ask your student to take their phone and put it away when they do homework. Then do an experiment, and then have them do homework with the phone next to them and see how long it takes them to do the same assignment. Just try it. The phone is unbelievably distracting for kids. It takes twice as long, in some cases studies have shown, to do your homework when there's a phone near you. So that's, so I think the, the technology, we don't understand quite the impact on kids. I also think um, they're growing up in, a really interesting time where, um, I'll, I'll just say climate change is in the back of everybody's mind, and especially this generation's, and they have no idea how to respond. Except like, okay, I'll eat better, right? Um, but they feel powerless, and that causes stress, right? 
the definition of stress is not having control over a situation. And it's, I get it. So I don't know exactly what's causing all the stress, but I think there's a combination of things. Yeah. I was wondering, we're seeing a lot of more reported stress and mental health issues on college campuses. And I'm wondering if there's a conversation between colleges and high schools. Because obviously, I don't think kids get to college and just immediately start feeling stress or immediately start having mental health issues. That's being manifested in high school. So I, I'm just wondering, it seems like there should be some sort of conversation going on. And also, just as a high school or this high school, to think about what, and, and the parents, obviously, what we all need to do as a community to strengthen our kids' resilience and ability to go to college and, and not just worry about that they can write a great essay, but that they can handle you know, the variety of things that happen on campus. Yeah, I can't agree. I mean, I, I, don't you hate when people say I can't agree more? It's like, what does that mean? That's a double negative. <laughs> so I completely agree with you. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't think we have enough time for me to talk about the college admission um, process. Um, I will say that I find it very challenging for young people to hear from colleges that they want well-balanced, um, students that take the most rigorous course loads and get all A's. That feels very confusing to them, and it's very confusing to us as a school, right? Um, I, I don't know what to do about that, honestly. Except there's a lot of really good colleges out there that are asking for kids that have taken a balanced course load, that have done some great work in their community, and who are kids, right? They haven't cured cancer, it's okay. <laughs> so, um, and, and there's some really good schools and we want our students to look at those schools more and more. And that's also part of what we're trying to do. So, um, yeah, college campuses are, under, they're really experiencing huge levels of, of stress and, and depression amongst their students, right? We're all, the other thing we're trying to get kids to look at when they look at schools is who are they gonna go to school with, right? One reason kids do choose, like, um, is even though it is a stressful place, it, they see it as a little less stressful than some other schools. So they see it as, oh, this is a place where kids are a little happier. So, so that's important, and that should be true of college as well. Like, go or you're gonna like, be with a bunch of people who are a little maybe healthy, right? So that's another thing we're trying to get kids to think about. It's a big conversation, though. Um, so thank you for that. This all leads to, actually, what are we going to do about this, right? So we're going to launch a strategic plan. And just to, um, just to, do I have 15 minutes? Oh my gosh. OK, well, just to tell you, we had a really good process. <laughs> and, Trisha, and Trisha Stone is a, just amazing. She led this school for two years through really deep thinking. Both our own community, some of you were here last year to do brainstorming with us, um, and we did that with um, different um, parent groups, with students, with faculty, with the board, um, with alumni. We looked at national trends, we looked at Bay Area trends. We just kept digging up data, and we came up with this amazing, strategic plan that we're really excited about. Okay, so here we go. Ooh. <laughs> um, so I'll just talk a little bit about the title. Um, it's called We Have a Vibrant Learning Community. Um, this is our Stuco, by the way. These are their hands, our student government. Um, it's not a stock photo. It's our real children. Um, I'm just going to go to the Weave project. So the theme of the strategic plan is based on an op-ed piece, actually, that David Brooks wrote um, called The Nation of Weavers. And, you know, David Brooks, great guy for some people, not so great for other people, so let's not talk about David Brooks, let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about the Weave project. Um, you can go to the Aspen Institute and look at the Weave project, and basically what it is I'll just read the quote. Um, Weaving is a way of life and state of mind, not a set of actions. It's about the spirit of caring 
you, re you bring to each interaction with someone else. It is a willingness to be open and loving, whether you get anything in return. As humans, we long for honest, deep connection. Weavers make the effort to build these connections and make others feel valued. So it's very aspirational, but this is what we're gonna be working on for five years, um, hopefully forever. But um, instead of leadership, and I, <laughs> I, lo I love this term, weavership. Um, so, you know, there was so much talk about leadership for so long. Like, let's get, in, like, let's get people, train kids to lead others, right? We want to train kids to weave communities together. We want them to be people that make connections and do it because it makes the world a better place, but it makes their hearts better. I know when I'm kind to others, I feel really good about myself. And so we're really excited about the theme of this, of this strategic plan. Um, and I think it, it will address the, uh, some of the really deep societal ills that we have in our country that walk in the door. We are not immune from them. Um, and I wrote a little bit about our imperfect union at the school, we have a lot of work here to bring people together in ways that are really loving. Um, so we have three threads in our new strategic plan. And the first one is Educate for Life. And everybody will, well you can get this online, but also we have a one pager. Pretty cool, right? So, so I don't, I'm hoping that you can see this. But the first one is really about Shifting the focus of our education from college to life. Um, and really getting kids to understand the skills that they're learning here are not skills for the next year. It's not, it's not a um, commodity to then trade into for next year. It's something that we want that will stick with you forever, right? We really we want to, and I'll tell you also, we're expensive, college is really expensive. Who knows in 20 years what will be happening in higher ed, right? We may not have kids going to college. They may just be going to high school, doing a really good job and starting that wonderful nonprofit, right? I don't know. So we want to educate students for life and we have various goals here. Obviously, a community of lifelong learners we want students to collaborate, participate, and lead to create a more just world. We want to support the emotional um, and social health of our students through fostering a sense of community, self-awareness, empathy, and inclusion. And ultimately, we want to engage our school community, including our alumni, in a lifelong dialogue and, and relationship. And so, for instance, if you pay a four-year tuition at life, that's a big investment. That investment should last a lifetime. So that means your connection to the school should keep giving and giving and giving, whether that's through alumni networks or coming back and learning from our kids or having classes taught by other alumni. We, we want this school to be a lifelong connection where it can really become a center for for weaving, right? For, where you can walk in this door, hopefully, and say, oh, I belong there. It doesn't matter when you graduated. Does that make sense? Um, there are some strategies over here. Because of time, I'm not gonna go into all of them. Um, we're gonna be very busy, Let me just say that. Um, the second thread is to nurture this amazingly dynamic community. And that includes prioritizing our flexible tuition program. So um, it is a, the har hallmark of the Comerding. I don't know if you know that the school was tuition free until 1972. Um, we are, are very committed as an independent school to try to create as much of an economically diverse community as we can. And so we have to really push and double down on our ability to do that for the future of the school. We want to extend our efforts to make sure this school reflects the diversity of, of where we live, um, and that people have equitable access to all the resources at the school. So that when you come here, 
nothing is off limits to you. And then actively build a culture of inclusiveness and belonging. And finally, we're gonna pay a lot of attention to our faculty and staff and really deepen the foundation. And this comes from the pressure that educators feel living in the Bay Area. It's, it's just getting harder and harder. So, luckily, has been a tiny, tiny bit inocu uh, uh, insulated from some of the pressures because we're on a BART line. So about a third of our faculty live in the East Bay where prices traditionally have been a little bit less. That's no longer the case, right? So we have to really look at how do we nurture and keep this great faculty and continue to recruit and retain a diverse faculty? How do we strengthen the bonds of our community where everybody feels valued at this school? And then how we explore and provide multiple paths for professional growth. And this is something that newer employees really want in their lives when they come to work for somewhere. Um, I will say, um, I get a lot of phone calls. How did you create a diverse faculty? And I think the number one way, and we have more work to do, is to have a mission that people are attracted to. I think people say, you know, well, we want to do this, we want to do that. It's like, well, look at your mission. Does somebody want to work there, right? Um, and to me, if you can create a school that really cares about the things that other people care about, then they want to be there. And I will say that that's why people come to work at this school. So those are the three threads of our new strategic plan. There's all kinds of other cool stuff in there that you can read about, um, including social justice at the school, the WEAVE project, and there you have it. So questions about our new strategic plan. Is that a good thing or not? <laughs> <laughs> My hope is when you have a chance to read through it that you do see reflected ideas that you expressed in your um, in the groups that we've that you participated in last year. So. Um, I will say the faculty did a first big exercise around our habits of mind. As you know, we have five habits of mind. We want to really look at that and maybe also have some habits of heart in there. Um, but really interesting things popped up with some consensus. We're nowhere near ready to, but I'll just tell you, like, don't go off and say, oh, new habit of mind, this is not yet. Um, but play came up, um, integrity, um, resilience, empathy, and compassion are ones that really have come up right now. Um, and, and again, we have more work to do. But I love that play came up. Uh, that was really fun. Questions? Yes? Uh, Eric, I love, I love the plan. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. How do you go about measuring it? Like, how do you know you're doing this thing and in five years from now it worked versus, oh my gosh, this all made sense and five years from now, whoops. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so different parts will, um, I think, it, um, have different types of measurement, right? So for instance, we're going to look at our schedule. Um, we're going to look at our daily schedule and our yearly schedule. That's a two-year at least process. I don't know if anybody's been in a school that they've changed the daily schedule. It, it's like, <laughs> it's crazy wild. It's, it's like buckle your seatbelt kind of thing, right? So what you do there, there is you do a lot of surveying before, and then you do a lot of surveying of teachers and students afterwards, but you have to give it at least a year for people to get used to, and then you have to give it another year to tweak it. And so, so some of the studying is, um, of effectiveness is longitudinal. Um, but then you can do smaller pieces. So for instance, some of it's just gonna be hard data. So the idea of nurturing um, uh, flex tuition and really, you know, I will say we will most likely be launching a campaign for flex um, um, and it'll just be measured how much money can we raise to sustain this program for the next 125 years, right? So there, I think, will be different types of things. I think some of it will be hard to measure. Um, some of the softer pieces of inclusiveness, there are better and better tools for measuring things like that. And um, I think we'll, we'll be abreast of those. 
Um, the adolescent mind also is really it's just fascinating. Right? It changes within an hour sometimes. So when you when you survey a adolescent, it can tell you a lot of different things. Yeah. You know, you didn't get a chance to get into a lot of the detail, but when you think about this weaving model, how do you think it's going to impact the way you evaluate students in class? How yeah. Is see, how, what are we going to see in progress reports? How does that come manifest? Such a great, great question. So, um, fortunately and unfortunately, we are in California, um, and so I don't. I think everybody knows this. To run a high school in California, you are. Um, you have to meet UC requirements. That means that the University of California approves all the courses that you teach, so you, you have to submit your syllabus to the UC, they have to approve that it's UC eligible, and the UC requires that you give them a grade. That right there is a structure that have, has proven challenging to us as a school. We would like to be doing more integrated curriculum so we would like to have a course where students are doing math and science. You can do that, but a student has to choose whether it's a math course or a science course on their transcript in order to get UC credit for it. So the UC won't recognize it as both. Does that make sense? And you have to give them a grade. So there is a national independent school movement called the Mastery Transcript, which is really interesting and I'm very interested in seeing where it goes, but I don't know how it's going to work in California. So urban schools, you know, for a long time did not give grades to students. They did give grades, they just didn't show them to students. They recently said, you know what, we can't do this anymore, it's not fair to kids. If we're giving them a grade, they need to see the grade, right? So, so that's a, so in other words, we're going to still have grades. Now, what does a grade stand for? That's where you have some wiggle room, right? And so, I think we've already made some interesting progress in how we grade kids. Our math curriculum, I mean, I think our math program in particular is working really hard on trying to grade progress and not um, talent, so to speak. So, we, we have, I don't have exact answers, but it will definitely be a big part of our discussion. How are we assessing kids and what are we assessing them on? Same idea. If we're seeing that the biggest issues are stress and mental health, what are the specific actions around that that are part of this plan? Yeah, so um, we're not going to have any classes. <laughs> it's going to come up, we're going to have donuts every day. No. <laughs> um, so already um, we're forming a homework committee right now. Um, so that's just one example. So right now we give we, our policy is we give an hour of homework per class. Well, should we be doing that for all ninth graders as well as 12th graders, right? So that's a question. Developmentally, probably not. And also, ninth graders tend to take more courses than 12th graders, so they're getting swamped. It used to be where um, design and technology and contemporary media and art didn't give homework, but these teachers are so invested in their classes that now every course, that they, whether it's an art class or a tech class, you have homework in that now. So that changes things a little bit. So one thing is homework is to look really carefully um, and how much homework are we giving? Um, so that's, that's one thing. Um, you know, we did add a full-time health counselor. We also have a health class that just started. This is its second year. We have a student inclusion director now. So we are just putting in place, we have a second learning specialist, so we invested a lot in student experience, so we have to see what the impact of that is. And then we have to have some real honest conversations. I will say, I've been, um, I've been in touch with a lot of schools that um, are part of the um, Challenge Success Program. It, it, it's a great vocabulary to use it doesn't necessarily mean the school is less stressful. It means that the dialogue around it is much healthier, right? So I do think we can create better dialogue to, for kids to be able to express what they're feeling. And so, because when you name something, it loses some of its power, right? And right now, I think they're churning. So how do we also help them understand their experience and give, give voice to it? 
So those are just some things right now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no school is perfect, and ours isn't either. But I got to tell you, just hearing this again this year, I'm so impressed with the thoughtfulness that you guys put into everything about, you know, that comes down to the practical, but also at a big picture level. So thank you so much. <laughs> no, um, yeah, you know, this is what I say about the Boomerang High School, is um, we are not perfect, but we are very, and we try to do this with humility, um, um, which is so important, um, and with pride, right? Um, and I really want us to always be a school that does not put our head in the sand around any issue, right? And that doesn't mean that we will react we will respond. Um, and I think for, for kids, that can be hard, right? Kids want reactions, but thoughtful schools respond after really thinking carefully about what we can do, right? So it's a school that I, I really believe this. We're, we don't have anything to hide. Um, so to bring on, right? I mean, it's the human condition. Here we go. Let's see what we can do to make it the best we can. Sure. Yeah. I was just wondering if there's follow up to the letter from the students that I mean when we were here for the parent teacher conference and our advisor or some advisor um, was talking about how beautifully written it was and there and the what the students had to say and I was wondering if the parents are able to access that letter and if there's any follow up to it. So can you talk about what you mean by follow up? Well, follow up, I was wondering if there's like a point person that students could be directed to if they had concerns, um, you know, a particular faculty member or something, or you, I mean, I'm not saying who it should be, but a, a point person who would, who would take take on that to, to, you know, open up the dialogue. And if there's been any, um, if you've heard from those students again. Yeah, so. I mean, I um, understand it's anonymous, but if, Yeah. So no, I haven't heard from the students again. Um, and yes, um, as far as making sure students know not only who they can go to, but how they can do that, and creating really clear avenues so that um, and, and being much more um, transparent about those avenues. And so that's all being worked out right now amongst the director of student in inclusion, our um, mental health counselors. Um, and student, um, the student council. Because we really want students involved in helping us design and implement programming that, that they feel part of making, right? So that's, that's it. Um, I'm a little bit, um, I'm a little bit stuck about whether to publish the letter publicly, and I'll tell you why. Um, it's not because I'm trying to hide anything, it's actually hanging on my window. It was written to the faculty and the administration. It wasn't written to parents, and it wasn't written to students. And I, and I don't know if I'm parsing or not, but part of me wants to respect the audience it was addressed to and not use their letter, <laughs> using maybe is the wrong word, but not take their letter and send it to, without, I don't have any permission to do that, right? So, so I haven't, chosen to put it out there in the public domain, so to speak. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And I've gotten pushback in the past for taking student concerns without their permission and, and using them more widely, so I want to be sensitive to that. Um, and then the other thing, you know, we take their concerns very seriously. I do, I, I, I struggle a little bit with anonymous communication because I, I don't know I don't know the extent of the communication. So I don't want to take that and also hold up anonymous communication that way. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know that a lot of students did read it. So it oh, no, the students, yeah. yeah. I don't, but yeah. I, but I understand what you're yeah. I, I respect that. Uh, particularly yeah. because it's anonymous, you don't really know even how many students were a part of the making of that letter. Right. No, I, and I have less, and I'll be really honest. Laura's probably like, you're fired. Um, <laughs> but um, 
like I, I I love working with everybody, but I really like working with students on thorny top in our school. Like that's who we're set up here to work with our students. We engage with parents, I think, as much as we can. I, I don't want this right now the students have asked us to be working with them, right? Now we have other ways to work with parents as well, but I'm trying to demarcate who we're responsible for at this point. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm like fire. No. <laughs> What's the gist of the letter? My son never mentioned it to me. Oh, um, so, it, um, you know, actually, it's in the, um, it's on the website. Um, it's on the, if you log in, you can read it. Read my response to the letter, so I'll let you do that. Okay. Other comments? Is it really hot in here? Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad, because I just got over the flu, and I'm like, oh, no, I'm sick again. <laughs> so, um, so I want to thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for your questions.